and gentlemen! Yes! This is really happening! I can't believe it! I've been dreaming of this moment for 25 months! And we're here! This is beautiful. Oh my God, it's so nice to see you all. Thanks to the global pandemic, more than 75% of men are now washing their hands when they leave the washroom. <laughs> That's got to be a good thing. I quite like all the sanitising and the distancing. Do you remember pre-Covid? You'd be in the Walmart lineup, wouldn't you? And you'd feel someone coughing down your... <coughs> and you'd think, I'm going to turn around and see someone wearing 10-day-old pyjamas. Yep, every fucking time. Every time. Huh? But pre-Covid, if you turned around and said, excuse me, I'd like two metres, please, everyone thought, what a dick! Now you're saving the world! I like it. It's the big question, isn't it? People say that. They say, oh, you know, when will you still wear a mask once it's all gone? When will you still wear a mask? I can tell you where. East side fucking Walmart. <laughs> and it's a crazy time. And remember when we had, like, a year ago, like a year, two years ago, when we had, like, no cases here? We had like no cases, everyone was still losing their shit, weren't they? Everyone was still freaking out. When we, we had like no cases and, and the politicians all took credit for it, didn't they? Right, it was all thanks to them. They came out like for their daily briefings, always a bit late, always a bit late, a bit busy. Come out a bit late, they're like, yeah, New Brunswick's number one in the world. We were number one, weren't we? We were number one, it was like us and you. First time we've been number one at anything. First time we've been number one at anything other than fucking illiteracy. But we all know the real reason why we had low case numbers in those early days, don't we? Yes, it's very simple. Because here in New Brunswick, we've been bloody socially distancing for decades. <laughs> They're like, OK, everyone, OK, to save, save lives, you've all got to stand two metres apart. Yeah, no shit, that's why we live here. <laughs> Always done that. It's not like London or New York or Toronto, where just to get to work in the morning, you squeeze into a subway, face in someone's armpit, elbow in someone's anus rubbing up against 80 strangers before you get to work. You can go months, if not years, in New Brunswick without making physical contact with another human being <laughs> that you're not choosing to make physical contact with, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and they took all the credit. And, but again, we were losing our minds, and we were all freaking out a bit, and it was weird. I would speak to my friends in England, like when we had like 12 cases in the whole province. There'd be like one new case, and everyone was on Facebook going, how the fuck did this happen? <laughs> Everyone's losing their shit on Facebook. I'd phone my friends in England and, and I'd be going, how are things going in, in England? How are things in London? Oh, they're going really good, James. Yeah, yeah. We're down to about 10,000 deaths a day on my street. <laughs> how are things in New Brunswick? Oh, we got four new cases last week and everyone's lost their fucking minds! <laughs> I said, but it's going well. I said, it's going well. We're doing contract tracing. We're doing track and trace. Track and trace, contact tracing. And my mates in England, they said, what's that? What's that? I haven't heard of that. What's that? And I said, you know, you know, you know, you, you know when you, when you like, go to a restaurant and you write down your name and number. And then if someone goes in there and they've got the COVID, the, the, the restaurant gives you the heads up. They say someone came in with the COVID. <laughs> My friends are like, how fucking few people live where you live? <laughs> how is that even a thing? They didn't believe me. They thought I was winding them up, right? So I had to prove it, right? I had to prove it. I had to pull out the TJ, right? Front page TJ. I was like, look, there it is. Look, track, tra you know, track and trace, contact tracing. And they were like, read it out, read it out. I'm like, all right. Were you in five and dine between eight and nine? <laughs> Were you in the St. John Owl house between nine and ten? <laughs> Were you at the dinner theatre between ten and twelve? 
did you pop into the Tim Hortons on Waterloo Street at 12 to buy some drugs? <laughs> Before ending your night at Freddy's Pizza? <laughs> if so, you might have come into contact with COVID. I read that and I thought, well, never mind, never mind exiling this guy or shunning him or exiling him to BC. That sounds like a fucking good night out. <laughs> that night out should have been sponsored by Discover St. John. <laughs> <laughs> the official Cortland Cronk night out brought to you by Discover St. John. But it's been tricky because we've all been through this collective trauma, like a, a, a moment in history. Like I remember as a child, I would go to my, my best friend, my grandma, and I would ask her stories. I would say like, Grandma, what did you do during the war? And she would tell me these amazing stories about things that happened during the war. And I would do this. And it's weird to think that our grandkids are going to be saying to us, what did you do in the pandemic, granddad? What did you do? And I'd be like, Where did, did, you fight? did you fight in that war? The pandemic, did you fight? I'd be like, yes, I fought that war, grandson. <laughs> Did you, Granddad? What, what did you do? Well, I did my bit. Well, what did you do? Well, I followed the arrows in Subis. <laughs> I followed the arrows in Subis. <laughs> two fucking years, I followed the arrows in Subis. Two, two years. follow the arrows, Grandad. Well, yes, unless Grandma was texting me, telling me to hurry up. And this happened to me a few weeks ago. Again, I, I followed the rules. I respect the rules, right? The government were navigating this best they can. I respect the rules. But I was following the arrows, and then my wife was texting me saying, hurry up, and I'm looking at the shopping list, and the last thing on the list is the ketchup, and I'm like, oh, I'm never going to find that now. And then I look up, and the ketchup's right there. I'm like, yay, that never happens. Look down, arrow pointing that way. <laughs> Thought, do I have to go all the way around? <laughs> no one's looking. But then there are security cameras up. And what if whoever's watching the security cameras phones like the, the snitch line? Do you remember the snitch line? Did you hear this? The, yeah, do you remember people, people were doing that, weren't they? They were turning on their neighbours, phoning up the snitch line, going, hello, is that Higgsy baby? Yeah, uh, there's three cars in my neighbour's driveway. Uh, they only own two. And they can't have bought a third because there's no fucking cars to buy right now. I think they're having a super spreader orgy. You, you better send Jenny Russell Rand to have a word. So, so I didn't want to break the rules and get caught out, right? So I thought, well, maybe I can reach for the ketchup like this. Re that's not breaking the rules. You can reach over an hour. It's a grey area. It's a grey area. So I'm reaching for the ketchup like this, and I almost had it, right? And then I fell, and my foot went right over the arrow. At that exact point, a woman walked around and saw me. Now, obviously, I've got my mask on, but she can see these two stupid eyebrows that look like well-trained caterpillars. <laughs> Now, she is that, that vile combination of a Rosé snob... <laughs> ..and a Covid Nazi. <laughs> and she sees me, immediately knows it's me, and she goes, ''It's that stupid British comedian! <laughs> he's not following the rules! He's not following the rules! Look, he's not, he's not following the arrows! He thinks he can do what he wants, stupid British comedian! He's probably got the UK variant!'' <laughs> That's my nickname now in the KV. <laughs> Not a good nickname to have. They're calling me the UK variant. <laughs> now I'm frozen on the spot because I'm freaking out thinking, oh my God, if she goes on the socials and starts slagging me off, I'm done for. Because I already got in trouble a few weeks before. I, I posted a picture on the Facebooks, right? And I left it for a few hours and I came back and there was like 100 comments. Where are the masks? 
Where were the masks? Where were the masks? It's my parents' wedding photo from 1974. They didn't know! They didn't know! They didn't know. People were loving it. Freaks, so I'm thinking, if she goes on the socials and says she's seen me and I'm frozen on the spot and she's getting angrier and angrier, stupid British comedian thinks what he can do, what he wants, UK variant. And you know, sometimes you just, an idea hits you. I don't know where it came from. I was frozen, I was traumatised, I was scared, but it just came to me. I turned around, faced the way of the arrow, walked backwards, grabbed the ketchup. <laughs> you can have that. You can have that. As long as you're facing the way of the arrow, they can't do ya. They can't do ya. Well, then I thought it was over, so I get into the lineup, right? And obviously everything's a bit slower now with the wiping and the sanitising. And again, things were slower in Sobiz before than other places, because, you know, when you go to the grocery store and you think, well, that looks like a safe bet. It's one lady, one milk carton. That's going to be in and out, surely. But what you haven't banked on is that Mavis there with the milk hasn't seen Doris the cashier for a couple of weeks. <laughs> And she wants a blow bly blow account of what went down at Chase the Ace last night. <laughs> and you can't kick off, can you? No, in, in London you can start a riot over that shit. Here we have to kind of, we all know each other, so you have to go, oh no, no, I don't need to be anywhere anytime, you carry on. <laughs> so, I'm in the line, I'm thinking, I need to get out, I need to get out. And then I hear the woman walking towards me. She's still slagging me off to anyone that'll listen. You, you see, I've come across that stupid British comedian, he was always banging on about where things used to be. You know, the one in fucking UK variant, he's not following the rules. I'm thinking, oh my God, then she's right behind me and she knows I'm there and she's still slagging me off. I thought this can't get any worse. And then it did. I felt a fucking cough coming on. <laughs> Would be the, the most terrifying thing you could do would be to cough in, but I can feel it rising. I think I cannot cough now. Well, that is it. I've, I've only just got my Canadian passport. I'm going to be evicted. Oh my God, <laughs> career is over. It's building up. I was this close to having to run outside the shop to do it, but then I was saved, ladies and gents. I felt a fart brewing at the exact same time. <laughs> that is the definition of the new normal right there. That is. Remember the good old days we used to cough to cover up our farts? Now we're farting to cover up our coughs. That's it. <laughs> that is it. And I think for all of us, it was the contradictions and the mixed messages, wasn't it? And again, I don't blame the government for this. They were doing their best. They were navigating something that they never thought they would have to navigate. And, and I understand that confusion, but it was weird. Like, some of the rules that came out were, were, were good ones. Like, I like the fact that it's no longer acceptable to cough and sneeze on strangers. And they, <laughs> it's a good thing. And they said that, didn't they? They said, no more coughing into the ether or into your hand. If you cough or sneeze, you've got to do it in this area here, wasn't it? it was, we were like, okay, that makes sense. So all the coughs and the coughs and the COVIDs and the flu all go in this area here. <laughs> Makes perfect sense. Oh, what do we do, though, if we see someone we know in the street? Well, glad you asked. Handshakes and hugs, now illegal. From now on, you've got to do the COVID handshake. The COVID handshake, how does that go? It goes like this. <laughs> Hang on a minute. So we're putting all the coughs and the colds and the COVIDs in here, and then we're fucking rubbing it on everyone. <laughs> This is the dirtiest part of my entire body. I'm coughing in it, I'm sneezing in it, I'm wiping my ass with it. My hands are absolutely spotless. You could eat your dinner off these. They've been washed 50 times a day, sanitized 100 times. Cleanest part of my body, this is filthy. But it was a funny thing, wasn't it? How globally every, every country in the world just agreed on that at once, didn't they? They were like, okay, this is the COVID handshake. We're stealing this from the Freemasons. We're taking that one. <laughs> we, all, we all agreed it. And then New Brunswick was the only province in the world to adopt the New Brunswick COVID handshake. Yes, you will have seen it. You will have seen it. All COVID handshakes globally start the same. They always start a bit awkwardly, don't they? And I've seen it tonight. Like, we're all kind of like, you don't know quite what to hear. Because you, you forget briefly, you're like, oh, hi. And then you're like, oh, no, 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 no. And you go in for the COVID. Now, the New Brunswick COVID handshake starts like that, starts the same as all the others, but it, it's slightly different at the end. The New Brunswick COVID handshake goes like this. Ah, fuck it. <laughs> Ha <laughs> ha
It is always, always, always followed up with the sentence, we're in a bubble. <laughs> and this has been, I mean, it has been a terrifying time. And again, every industry was affected. I mean, on that dreaded Friday, March 13th, 2020, obviously that was the day I was told th this show couldn't happen the day after because there was this thing called the COVIDs. And it felt like a temporary thing. And then over subsequent weeks, it, it got properly scary. I lost upwards of like 40 shows. Um, and obviously then you discover that all these flights that you've booked to do those shows won't be refunded by the, by the airlines. And it was properly scary. But of course, everyone had to find other ways of doing things. And it was wonderful to see the, 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 the kind of innovation, especially in this region, of, of, of ways to make things work. And of course, I mean, there was me, honestly, genuinely panicking. We were very close to thinking we were going to have to go back to England, live with my parents, not top of my list of things I wanted to do. <laughs> And then someone, um, and I cannot take credit for this, an amazing guy called Jeff at Poker Logan Productions had the idea that we should do a, a, a comedy show in a drive-in movie theatre. And it was the first one in all of Canada. Sussex, New Brunswick on the map, ladies and gents. Yes, Sussex. Hats off to Sussex. We beat Winnipeg by a day, right? <laughs> It, it, and, and it became like a big thing across the country. Everyone was doing it in Montreal, Just For Last were doing it in Ottawa. Everyone was doing it, but Sussex was first. Now, I'd never been to a drive-in before, so it's my first time at a drive-in, and I'm on stage first at the drive-in. It's the first show of its kind, first one, it's my first one. So all I knew of drive-ins is what I've seen in North American movies. So it was a very glamorous concept to me. I'm like, all, I'm like Greece is one of my favorite films. So I thought, oh, if you go to the drive-in, you might get fondled by Danny Zuko. <laughs> Why I went, big fan, big fan. <laughs> so the reason it was a driving, of course, was it was two months of no performances, which is the longest I've gone in basically 20 years of not performing. And he came up with this concept, of course, so that everyone could be distanced, you couldn't leave your cars, um, and you could enjoy a show. So, of course, with the driving, as you know, you watch the movie and the, the, the sound is in your radio, in the car. I didn't know that part of it. So for a live comedy show, you, you have a little stage that no one can really see, but there's cameras around, and of course that's projected onto the screen. I didn't know about the FM radio thing or that there wouldn't be a PA system. So I arrive there, first time at a drive-in, I get onto the little stage, there's cameras everywhere. I start, I start, I go, hello, Sussex. Oh, it's not on, it's not on, because I couldn't hear a PA system. <laughs> So I'm, I'm like, it's not on, it's not on, that's not working, guys, it's not, it's not working right. And I see a guy running from the projector booth at the back of the field. Because I can't see any people, all I can see is 300 cars, right? <laughs> so there's five minutes of me going, it's not on, it's not on, it's not on. And he's running, and he gets to me and he goes, it is on. They're listening to you, tap the mic, you're deafening them, banging the mic. <laughs> They've just listened to you for five minutes saying it's not on, banging the mic. This is the worst start to a show ever. <laughs> I went, oh. So I, I, I composed myself. I told my first joke. Silence. <laughs> and I, I'm thinking this is going to be a long fucking hour. <laughs> All I'm looking at is cars. I'm not going to know if they're laughing. I'm going to have to talk for an app. Oh, my God. But then, through osmosis or New Brunswick resilience, I don't know what it was, we formulated a system whereby I would do the punchline and they would express their joy and laughter by honking their horns and flashing their lights. <laughs> it was amazing. It was a wonderful moment. Just... It was six or seven minutes in. I just thought I'm going to deliver this the best I can. And six or seven minutes in, we just formulated this system. And again, the next day, we, we spoke. The Winnipeg promoters phoned us to ask how does it work. And we said, this is how it works. They honked their horns and flashed their lights. And it felt magical. And just to be back doing the job that I love, back being able to provide for my family. And again, I just basically pretended that the cars were people, right? <laughs> it was a bit like doing a gig in a Disney Cars movie. <laughs> right, you know, what's, what's the deal with the homemade wine? Honk, honk, flash, flash. Ooh, Lightning McQueen likes that one. <laughs> oh, Maida likes that one. Well, no, it was Sussex, it was all, all Maiders. <laughs> 300 Maiders. Looks like a fucking freedom convoy out there. about that one. Right? It popped in my head and I thought, don't say that, and then it came out. <laughs> <laughs> I 
and it was and it was weird because it, for all of the faults, like I'm up there and I'm, I'm wearing a full suit and it's a, it's a beautiful summer's day. I am just dripping in sweat. There are hundreds of June bugs on my back, right? <laughs> I know I'm being bitten by mosquitoes constantly and, and I'm up there and I'm just doing it and the honks and the flashes and just the fact that after two months of, of, of lockdown we found this way to make this work and despite the June bugs and the mosquitoes and then of course you're competing with the sounds of Sussex. There's, there's generators going, there's four wheelers, there's the sounds of people fucking animals in the field next door. <laughs> So I know we're better than that, we're better than that. But I did do that joke in Sussex two weeks ago and they loved it. Um, but I got about 40 minutes in and I'm, we're getting into a rhythm and despite all of these kind of distractions, it seems to be working well. And then suddenly they all just start honking and flashing really aggressively. Like, just, like not a punchline, just doing it. And I'm doing what I do, pacing up and I'm like, what, 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 what's going on, what's going on? And I couldn't figure it out and of course they couldn't tell me. And I, couldn't, and I looked down, I kid you not, there's a raccoon following me around the stage. <laughs> and I know that watching me is a bit like watching Wimbledon tennis. You're like, really, stand still. The raccoon was keeping up! <laughs> it was magical and it felt special. And, and for the subsequent the next few weeks, people kept asking, like, will you do a virtual show? And I was unsure about it and, and I didn't know whether it would work. But then again, since then, I've actually now done about 70 of them, grown to love it. I don't know if you know how a virtual gig works, but essentially I have a little studio set up at home and the laptop's here, there's a camera there. There's a, I stand there with a mic and I have a little stage theatre curtains behind me. And basically, it's on, done by a, a Zoom or Teams or WebEx. And basically, they're all muted, so the s sound of laughter isn't kind of distracting or distorting. But they keep their cameras on so I can see them laughing. So for the last 25 months, I basically had to replace my love of the sound of laughter with a love of just a grid of just little boxes of people going. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting in their offices or hot tubs. And, and it's a wonderful thing, <laughs> literally. You, 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 the shit that I've seen, honestly. <laughs> And it's amazing, I did one last week for RBC Manitoba. It was like nine in the morning, it's self-appreciation day. And it's become this, a, a thing now, it's no longer a compromise, it's a separate art form. And, and, and there's certain benefits to it. Like, sometimes you'll be doing it, and sometimes it'll be for like 100 people, it could be for 4,000. I did one for uh, the New Brunswick teachers and custodians. And hats off to Zoe Watson, it was an amazing idea. Uh, yes, give, give it up for the New Brunswick teachers, custodians, um, true heroes. Zoe Watts, an amazing woman, she, she realised that a lot of the custodians were going to be working in the schools the night of the show. So she put up all the big screens in the schools so while they were working they could watch the gig. Beautiful. Innovation. Beautiful. Um, but everyone would, would keep their cameras on. So in that case, there's like 4,000 people on it, which means that you can only fit like 20 or 30 people on a page. So if there's some miserable bastard not laughing, I would be standing here talking, but you, what they wouldn't see is my hand would go up and I'd move the non-laughing prick to another page. <laughs> and then scroll through and find someone that was losing their shit laughing, bring them forward. So 10 minutes in, I've curated my own audience. <laughs> I couldn't do that in a club, start moving people around. You're not laughing enough, you're going to the back. And uh, I, I went to it, but last June I was doing one for the, for the YPO, the Young Presidents Organization. It's a global organization, but it's, uh, it was for the North American contingent. So it was CEOs and presidents from across Canada and America. Almost every state and province represented. It's about 60 of them, and it's a Saturday night, it's about 8 p.m., and I'm about halfway through. It's going quite well. There's lots of. <laughs> and I think we're on board here. And then suddenly I'm like on a setup, like on a setup to a joke. I'm not saying anything, like now when you're looking at me going, get to the fucking point, mate. Like the, <laughs> the setup point, the setup. Blank faces. And I just paused or I said because or something. And they all in unison just burst into hysterics. And I'm like, what is going on? I was so enthroned by it, I, 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 I stopped talking. I mean, oh, oh, what's, what's, and they laughed even more. I'm like, this is weird. And I'm like, what's going on? Like, they can't have all received the same text at the same time because they wouldn't have all been able to read it. No one's walked in the room because they're in every different province and state. And I'm, and I'm looking down, like, what's happened? What's happened down here? I'm completely thrown by it. And they're just laughing more and more and more. And then I hear a sound behind me. I turn around. My seven year old son, River, is standing there naked, waving his willy at them. <laughs> Years 
I've been doing this job. Not once have I thought, I do hope a seven-year-old doesn't show up and steal the show by waving his willy at the audience. <laughs> but I'll be honest, you know what really upset me? What really upset me most was the fact that I've actually never seen an audience laugh harder. <laughs> I think when I'm eventually allowed back on the road, I'll bring River with me at any time. Oh my God, there's a beautiful baby there. Hi. Hi, everyone say hi to the baby. Hold, do you mind holding on? What's your baby's name? Oh my God, sorry, sorry to interrupt. What's your baby's name? Beg a pun? Claire. Claire, hi Claire. This is Claire's first comedy show, I'm assuming. I do hope Claire's first word is not the F word now after tonight. I'm, I'm going to clean up the rest of the show. Thank you so much for bringing Claire to. This is amazing. She's going to, she's going to like, learn things. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my God, congratulations. How, how many weeks old is Claire? Four months old. Oh, my God. Give it up for Claire. Her first comedy show. How well is she behaving? Amazing. Beautiful. And where was I? Yes. So there was me thinking, well, if eventually, if things go back to normal, I'll take River on the road with me. Anytime a gig goes bad, I'll just be like, oi, River, come on out. And he can go, fucking you, fucking we, fucking. I mean, he, he wouldn't be saying fucking, obviously, obviously. <laughs> we, we raised him proper. <laughs> He'd probably be saying, uh, how many Paw Patrol toys am I getting for this again, Dad? <laughs> Chase is on the case, son. Get your dick out. Come on. <laughs> and I, th oh, I don't know where that came from either. I apologise. I think the other thing that was strange at the beginning was people's obsession with watching, like, pandemic movies. Like, everyone I spoke to was saying, oh, my God, James, you've got to watch this movie, Contagion. I'm like, why? It's ten years old. It's been on Netflix for years. And they said, yes, but now it's number one on Netflix globally. I'm like, why? They said, it's about a pandemic, James. It's just like this. It's just like this. I watched that movie. Nothing like this. <laughs> there was not a single scene in that movie where a family of four did not leave the couch for four days straight. <laughs> because they were eating industrial-sized bags of Chicago mix and drinking boxes of wine for breakfast. <laughs> I got very into the boxes of wine, I did. I used to be a wine bottle drinker, but I felt like A&BL was shrinking the bottles. So about 17th of March 2020, I pivoted to the box. That goes quick too, doesn't it? The box goes quick too, yeah. I found myself, my first box of wine, I found myself like ripping the bag out, standing at the sink, <laughs> sucking the bag, <laughs> lips around the teat, <laughs> milking the bag. <laughs> There's definitely more in this, love. I'm not having it go to waste. <laughs> Playing it like a bagpipe. Looked over at the oven clock, 10.15 a.m. <laughs> Time to start the homeschooling, kids. <laughs> Question number one, how much has Daddy had to drink this morning? <laughs> it's written on the box, you shitheads. <laughs> well, that's right, you can't read because I'm your teacher. I mean, the drinking got out of hand. I mean, it was really, I'm normally a sensible person. Like, I'll, every now and again, I'll take a week off or a month off just to show that I can, right? But during the pandemic, if I went a day without drinking, I was all, like, righteous. Oh, yeah, I'm basically... Yeah, I'm all, yeah, I can have double tomorrow now, yeah. <laughs> not drinking for a day was the new not drinking for a month. <laughs> and my wife was adamant. She said, James, this can't carry on. You can't just eat pizza every day and drink every day. You've got to get in shape. You've got to do something. I said... Now is not the time for talk like that. <laughs> she said, no, I've got good news. She said, I've read about this thing called intermittent fasting. She said, you can eat and drink what you want for certain hours of the day, but then you can you starve or fast yourself for a protracted period, and it can be overnight. And I said, no, I don't like the sound of that. But, but full credit to my wife. She's actually done that for the last 14 months. She has, she's done it 14 months. Well, I say that, uh, what I mean is she passes out drunk at 9 p.m. every night <laughs> and is too hungover to eat till 12 noon the next day. <laughs> Works. <as> <laughs>
the other thing that, of course, happened in the last two years is that uh, Cannabis NB finally turned a profit. Didn't know that happened. <laughs> happened. Because I'm sure you're all aware of this. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that prior to the global pandemic, the New Brunswick government were actually the first people in world history to lose money selling drugs. <laughs> I, I didn't even know that was possible. <laughs> I'm no expert at the drug trafficking game, but what I've learned from Netflix shows like Narcos New Brunswick <laughs> is that if you're bereft of morals or willing to take risks, if you sell the drugs, quite an easy way to make a tiny profit. Not these shitheads. <laughs> no, they were hemorrhaging taxpayers' money selling weed legally in New Brunswick. <laughs> But, full credit, they turned it around, didn't they? They turned it around. All they needed, all they needed was to come out and say, OK, you can't leave your house, you can't go to work, your kids are trapped in there too. There's a load of free money. And that thing we would have thrown you in jail for possessing a year ago is now an essential service, fill your boots. And it amazes me when I look back to the stuff we were worrying about before. It all seems so meaningless. Like, I, I found a Facebook memory post. Shane was mentioning Facebook memories. I found one at, at the end of last year. It was from two years ago. It was the end of 2019. And it was like, farewell, 2019, worst year ever. And I'm like, what was so... That was like the best year ever. <laughs> Why did I have a problem with that year? And I think back to those things. Like, I mean, I remember the start of 2020. I looked at the rest of the world. And I looked at, 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 at England, like Boris Johnson, a, a racist, sexist, homophobe, had forced his way into being Prime Minister and then forced Brexit through and, and it was about to sink the British economy and had numerous children by different women and denied it and lied about it and refused to pay for him. Uh, and he was sitting comfortably in his job, right? And then in America, we had, had Donald Trump, right? Numerous <laughs> sexual assault allegations, corruption, one, arguably one of the most corrupt people in public office in world history, sitting comfortably in his job. Meanwhile, here in the GSJ, Poor old Quiz Pamps' mayor, Gary Clark, couldn't even go for a fucking swim! <laughs> without getting impeached! <laughs> it's his pool! It's the Quiz Pamps' plex! If he wants to save two buck fifty to go for a swim, let him, what a high standard we hold our elected officials to here. <laughs> Look at the shit they let prime, prime ministers and presidents get away with in other parts of the world, but here in GSJ, oh no, you use a false name to get into a swing pool. Impeachment! <laughs> but let's face it, we all know the real reason why everyone was so mad about it in the quiz pound, don't we? It's very simple. It's very obvious, it's because he used a fucking Rosé address. <laughs> that is unforgivable in the quiz pan. And the other thing everyone was talking about, obviously, prior to all this, was, was that Harbour Station got a new name. Of course, it will forever be known as where Harbour Station... Beautiful! <laughs> See? It's not just musicians that can do sing-alongs, right? <laughs> Comedians can do them too. Fucking karaoke comedy all the way. Right. Where Zellers used to be. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> I have become a bit of a guide, actually, for new people moving here, moving to the region. People asking me, because now I know what I've, I've done a degree in failed Canadian businesses. <laughs> Just to, so you can't mess with me now. I can, you can, yeah, you, you can't confuse me. You want to know where the new dollar arm is? I'm like, yeah, no problem. It's where Woolco used to be. No problem. <laughs> I know them all. I know them all. People ask me. By the way, a cheer, how many people in this room have moved here in the last two years? <laughs> Beautiful. Welcome. Where, where, did you, where did you move from, madam? Alberta. Alberta. Well, welcome. <laughs> welcome. And welcome, everyone. <laughs> welcome to this beautiful place. Because... We have been begging for population growth here for, for, for decades, and we finally got it, and everyone's now fucking complaining that house prices are going up. <laughs> well, what we did, that was going to be finally got... But I want to say, well, because when I moved here eight years ago, no-one said, 
welcome to me, right? Not because they've been rude, it's because here in St. John they've adopted a different welcome, and I know you would have been given this one. No one says welcome or greetings when you move here. You all say, why the fuck did you move here? <laughs> you've, got you've got to stop doing that, right? How, how many people said that to you? Everyone, everyone. <laughs> it doesn't help making newcomers feel like idiots for coming here. Like, and again, you're walking around going, why are you saying that? Look around, you've got beautiful views, friendly people, and thanks to annual flooding, waterfront mansions that cost 79 cents. <laughs> well, welcome. I'm so glad you found your way here. Um, and if you ever need help with finding where things used to be, I am your guide. <laughs> I am your guide. Yes, uh, Harbour Station got a new name because there's a different name now than the original one that they touted. So I'm sure you all know that the home of the Sea Dogs uh, needed help, uh, financial help, and so the amazing Frank McKenna stepped in with TD Bank and they landed on a name and they all agreed on the name and they made the signs and they had everything made up and they were just about to announce it and it was the Sea Dogs TD Centre and they realised the abbreviation was STD Centre. <laughs> Only in St. John would someone try and call our hockey arena the STD Centre. They realised their mistake when they Googled that and realised that what comes up is not Harbour Station, but the sexual health clinic in the North End. Which, ironically enough, has a longer fucking lineup outside it every day than Harbour Station's ever had. Ah. <laughs> oh. And again, I mean, so anyone here move here from England or another country? No, no? oh no! <laughs> you were the last fucker we're letting in! She was... She's on the border, isn't she? She's one of those people that was loving the lockdown. Yes, this is the way I want it. No one in, no one out. Some people were loving it. Like, do you remember the start when we were watching every day, like at 12 noon, we would tune in to Trude Trudeau would come out, wouldn't he? We were all confused, and we'd all be there, and we'd call the family, and quick, Trudeau's coming, Trudeau's coming, Trudeau's coming on, figure what's going on, and Trudeau would come out, and it'd be like, it's time for Trudeau's daily cash giveaway! He'd walk out of that money printing house that he's got. They're just printing money in there. He'd walk out every day, the beard would be a bit shitter. <laughs> and he would trot out the same platitudes. We're all in this together. It's an uh, unprecedented time. We need to pivot. And we'd be all sat there going, get to the fucking lottery, Trudeau. <laughs> get to the giveaway. We're all sat there with our virtual scratch cards going, come on. Get to the kids, he's, he's, he's doing it, he's doing it. And then he would eventually get to it and he'd be like, and we've got money for you, 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 money for you. You got anything for British comedians living in New Brunswick? No, fuck all again. Okay, we'll try again tomorrow. Maybe it'll be a rollover. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, beautiful. Well, I mean, again, I've met people, Brits and things that have come here. And again, I like the fact that you don't like to make it easy on us. Like, you, as Canadians, are very well-versed in British vernacular because you've studied the works of Downton Abbey and Coronation Street. <laughs> Whereas the only thing of Canadian... I've embraced every facet of Canadian culture since becoming a Canadian and since moving here, but the one thing that I, I'd only think... The only thing I'd actually seen of Canadian culture before moving here was the Trailer Park Boys. <laughs> which is really only useful if you're moving to Sussex. <laughs> so, and again, no one told me about all of the... I didn't know what the word difference is. Now, when I was last on this stage, uh, seven years ago, is it eight years ago now? Seven years ago, um, I told a story, a true story, about an incident that happened to me in my first week here when I went to see a doctor, Dr. Daniel Scott, Grand Bay Westfield Doctor Surgery. Now, I, oh yes, it's a wonderful day. He, he loves me telling this story, hates it. Um, <laughs> because I didn't know that these, these things here, tra these, right, trousers, trousers, you call these pants, don't you? Well, in England, pants are the underpants. <laughs> yeah, that made my first doctor's appointment pretty fucking awkward. <laughs> A 
went to see Dr. Daniel Scott with my injured knee. First week living here, and he said, uh, take off your pants, I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> Thought, that's a bit odd. <laughs> Why's he got to get in all this malarkey? <laughs> and then I thought, when it is my first appointment since moving here, maybe he's got to do the full checkup. <laughs> you know, the full check you know what I'm talking about when I refer to the tappy tappy? <laughs> Matthew, Dwayne, Matthew, you know, don't you? For any men in here that are under 40, when you hit 40, you learn something new about your body every year. Like at 40, you go in one day and the doctor's like, you've got to take all your clothes off and we're going to do tap tap on the testes. And they, they try and put you at ease and you're like, yeah. And the doctor will say something thinking it helps, it doesn't. He's like, are you going on holiday this year? And every man in the world does the same thing. We go, I don't know. She might have booked something, I don't know. At that exact point, he goes, tap, tap, and we go, ooh, like that. It's a little tree, right? Now, that was, yeah, that's what happens when you turn 40. Actually, very quickly in bracket, I turned 42, obviously, in lockdown. In fact, my 42nd birthday was uh, that March uh, 14th, that day the show was supposed to take place. It was my birthday. It was supposed to be big, and of course, terrible, terrible thing. Lose the show, no birthday party, miserable. And, but on March 14th, right, I learned something about my body. And this is the thing, when you become a man at 40, every year there's something new. So for the first 42 years of my life, every time I went for a wee or, or a pee, it was the same. Go in, unzip, member out. <laughs> Do the wee, right? Finish the wee. Shaky, shaky, shake. <laughs> if I was feeling a bit posh, dab, dab, dab. <laughs> Yeah, it was my birthday and someone might be... <laughs> down. <laughs> down on there later, right? Just down there. And then put my member away. End, end of we, end of P, right? That's, that's how it works. 42 years. I turn 42. Overnight, it changes. Starts the same. You go to the washroom, member out, do the we, shaky, shaky, shake, dab, dab, dab. Put the member away, whole other piece happens! <laughs> Where does it come from? And I don't mean a dribble, I mean a bigger piss than the one you went in there to do! <laughs> and I thought that must just be a one-off fluke, but no! Every time I go, I go in, I'm like pushing in the blood, I'm like, there's definitely nothing in there, definitely nothing in there, no, that's, that's good, yeah, definitely good, put it away, massive piss every time. <laughs> It's as if the we is travelling through the member, and as it gets there, it's like, come on, lads, let's fuck with him, hold on. <laughs> oh, he's trying to shake us out, nice try. Nice try, oh, look, he's dabbing the top, how sweet. Yeah, good luck with that, mate, good luck with that. Hang on, lads, we're, go we're going into the underwear, we're going in, we're going in, we're in, go, 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 Psst. If someone had said you're off to see a comedian tonight that's going to do an impression of piss in a penis, <laughs> you would have said, no, nah, we're better than that. <laughs> Apparently we're not. But I will say this, I mean, it, it is bad. And now, when I go to bed in the evening, I can't sit down on the toilet for about 40 minutes. <laughs> Pile of books there, I'll sit down, I'll be like, right, sit down, first wee, not falling for that. <laughs> 20 minutes later, second wee. I'm thinking that should be good. I've had nothing to drink since lunchtime. <laughs> I'll wait another 20 minutes. Yeah, I think we're good. Pull up the pyjamas, massive piss every night. <laughs> every night walking into the bedroom, my wife's like, why's there a massive wet patch? I'm like, oh, I was washing my face and the water spills. <laughs> it's like every night? <laughs> I will say this, not just comedy tonight, medical advice. I found a solution to this, and you can have this. Jenny Russell can use this at the next announcement. Yeah. <laughs> now there's no more COVID, apparently. So, you go for the Wii, and because of distancing, this makes it easier, you can sometimes, you can talk to it, right? Talk to it. So I'll do the Wii, and I'll be like, oh, that was a jolly nice Wii. I'm going to put you away now. <laughs> Make sure no one's listening, they'll think you can... But you put it away a bit slower than normal, and what the member doesn't know is that your thumb is over the elastic of the underwear. 
and you get it in, and as soon as it touches the underwear, pull it out, and the wee goes in the bowl. <laughs> you are welcome. Anyway, sorry, that was all in brackets. My point is, I thought Dr. Scott wanted to give me a tappy tappy, is the point. So I took off all my clothes. I'm standing there naked in my wife's family doctor for life's waiting room, my first week living here, and I've no idea why I did what I did next. I heard footsteps coming towards the door. He's not expecting to see any of this. <laughs> I'd been living here for three days. Everyone I'd met had said, firstly, why the F did you move here? Followed up by, uh, which Irving company do you work for? <laughs> and when I said, no, no, I'm a comedian, they all went, oh, no, no. <laughs> Can't do that here, nothing to laugh about in New Brunswick, no. <laughs> Gotta go out west if you want to do the jokey joke. So maybe I was trying to be funny, I don't know what it was, but all I know is, as he finally got to the door, for some unknown reason, I did this. Now I am banned from Dr. Scott's office. <laughs> and I have to have my tappy-tappies with my doctor in London, which has meant for the last two years doing them over Zoom. <laughs> and I will say, if you are teabagging a laptop, make sure you correctly exited the Teams meeting you were just in. <laughs> Um, anyway, so my point is, that was a story that I told here on this stage seven years ago. I thought after that that you might inform me of other words that I didn't know were different here. But no, you like to mess with me. <laughs> I only discovered one two years ago. It was right before lockdown. It was Christmas 2019, right? And I'd never knew this in the, all those years of living here. Because in England, this tuft of hair in England is called a quiff. <laughs> and I'm not making that up, that's... And, and if you Google, I know here it's ladies front bottom, isn't it? It's, they, if you Google quiff here, even then it comes up with the British term, it's like Elvis's quiff. Elvis has a nice quiff. And I have proof, because Ethan Ash brought me a gift from England, right? He brought me a gift. This is a special hair gel and it says, texturizing, powder to cream for quiff styles. <laughs> powder to cream, I'm not sure about that. So I had no idea that here it meant ladies' vagina, right? Because <laughs> no one told me. Do you know how I found this out? I was in my wife's hairdressing salon. <laughs> there are 20 people lined up having their hair done. It is a long room. I'm at this end reading a magazine waiting for her. We are headed that night to a Christmas party, a fancy dress 70s party. I'm sat there reading a magazine. There is people lined up having their hair done. My wife's hairdresser, Chris, shouts down. He shouts down, Oi, James, what should I do? What should I give her? And I shouted, Why don't you give her a nice quiff? Proof that New Brunswick is the funniest people in the world. Without missing a beat, he shouted, but everyone's in hysterics. He shouts back, doesn't she have one already? Now they are all in hysterics in there and they can't even catch their breath. And I'm wondering what the hell is everyone laughing at? And then they eventually explain it to me that here it doesn't mean this, it means this, right? And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. For about a few months prior to that, I'd been trying this joke, and it's not very funny, but I have to tell it to you for the context. I've been doing it around the Maritimes, um, and, and wherever I did it, the joke was simply, Quiz Pam says, nice place, stupid name for a place, because you can't say it without sounding drunk. You get pulled over by the cops, were, were, you, were, were you speeding? No. Were you drinking? No. Where'd you live? Quiz Pam says, get in the van. <laughs> you don't have to laugh. Not a good... But wherever I did it, and I remember I did it on Cape Breton Island, um, in uh, Port Hawkesbury, I did it in, um, in, in Pictou County, and, and, and but I'd say about a dozen times people would come up to me after the gig and they'd go, ha 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 ha, you said uh, Chris Pam Sis. Do you know what we call it? And I'd be like, well, yes, people keep telling me, but I don't know why, it's funny. And they would go, kiss Pam's quiff.
kiss Pam's quiff. And I used to go, well, what's funny about kissing the front of someone's... Yeah, what, why is that funny? Now, what made it extra funny when I realised it in that moment was that my wife's name is fucking Pam. <laughs> And yes, I have. <laughs> oh. That was one. But my number one WTF moment over the past two years would have to be what happened. I would, it was about June 2020. Now, to give this a bit of context, we are all lucky enough to be able to say, or most of us are probably lucky enough to say, the, 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 the restrictions that were put on us didn't necessarily affect things. So, for example, I did a gig recently for addiction services in New Brunswick, all the people that work in addiction services, and they said it was a kind of an undiscussed thing that people with addictions, whether it be drugs or alcohol or particularly sex, just because there's a coronavirus, they're not going to stop needing that fix. So I guess most people in this room probably like to sleep with one person mainly. I'm not going to do a survey, chill out, all <laughs> shitting yourselves. But, but regardless, right? But if you're addicted to sex, you can't suddenly stop needing the, the, the sex just because there's the COVID. So the Canadian government came out with something, which, yes, do you know what I'm about to say? Some of you know this. They came out with a recommendation, which they quickly kind of backtracked on, but luckily I screenshotted all of it. <laughs> They came out with a recommendation that if you want to continue having sex during the coronavirus, a safe way to do it would be to use glory holes. <laughs> Does everybody know what a glory hole is? Does anyone not know? You don't, you don't, oh sorry, but yeah, uh, I, how old are you? 17. 17, okay, I apologize. Do you mind me explaining it to her mum? <laughs> I... I will do this as clean as I can. And, and it's, what is your name, madam? Abby. Abby, lovely to meet you, Abby, and thank you for coming to the show. You obviously bought tickets first, your center. I hope this isn't gonna scar you for life. But basically, <laughs> in England, glory holes are all the rage. In Canada, less so, because you are a civilized country. Like, oh, okay, okay, no. In England, you cannot go into an English pub without seeing a glory hole. Now, a glory hole essentially is, I will probably go and, I, I have the news article, I'll read it. Essentially, it's a hole in a pub toilet wall that people put their genitals through to have sex with basically anyone. Like, obviously, very unfussy people. I assume it's men, I assume it's men. I'm not sure many women are standing there going, oh, I'll just see what happens. <laughs> so, uh, see what shows up. Only men would behave. So men, I guess they go in and they get themselves, I guess, and then they put it through the, the whole, and I don't know what the thought process is. Like, do they, how long do you wait? <laughs> and I guess you have to be very unpicky because it, it could be anyone. It could be any gender, it could be anyone could put anything over it. And I don't know what the thought process is. Like, if I'm sat there on the loo in the pub, right? I'm on the loo, on the loo, and then just suddenly, What is the thought process? Is it that I'm going to sit there and go, well, since I'm down here... Does that, does that sound sensible, Abby? I don't know. Or I don't know, Abby, maybe if you don't want it, maybe you pick up the toilet roll and stick it on. Just use the toilet, mate. Kudos to Shane Ogden. He came up with that toilet roll joke the other night. Um, but I will read you, so I'm sorry, Abby, it's, it's, it's terrible. So in Canada, it's not a big thing. But in England, it's all the rage. You know, every, every pub toilet has one. But, but they, the Canadian government literally... So this is not my fault. I know this bit's a bit rude, and I apologise for that. But I didn't start it. The fucking Canadian government did, OK? So it's not... My... <laughs> but I'm going to read you the uh, article from Global News, if I may. OK, this is, this, is, this, is, this is really it. The headline is, Try glory holes for safer sex during coronavirus, um, the Canadian um, health authorities have suggested. So it says... Canadian health officials are recommending an age-old... Oh, it's, it's age-old. <laughs> age-old, occasionally cutting-edge tactic for sex during the coronavirus pandemic, glory holes, which you now know. Everyone now knows all on board. 
The Canadian Centre for Disease Control added new recommendations. One of those tips was to try... Well, I suppose it would be a tip. Um, <laughs> one of those tips is a glory hole. A hole cut through a wall that's only large enough for a penis to slip through. <laughs> glory holes are typically used for anonymous, oral or penetrative sex. Uh, they allow for sexual contact but prevent face-to-face -face contact, right? <laughs> safe, safe, safe. Oh, the site includes many other tips for reducing your risk of spreading the coronavirus during sex, such as wearing a mask, <laughs> refraining from kissing, using a, a condom, uh, helps, unless you wear it over your head, I don't know, <laughs> and washing your body with soap and water. Be creative with sexual positions like physical barriers. Uh, the, uh, the Canadian government also recommends taking your desires into your own hands. <laughs> if you're worried about a coronavirus infection. Oh, there we go. Oh, this was actually from the health, from the health authority. It said, um, you are your safest sex partner. <laughs> Masturbating by yourself. Solo sex will not spread COVID-19. <laughs> Guess it depends how you do it. <laughs> it's too, too far, too far. No, 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 don't tap that, no. Don't, 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 don't encourage me. Uh, well, it says here that the Canadian government wanted to emphasise that this is just a suggestion and not compulsory. I should imagine so. You can't introduce mandatory glory holes. <laughs> they're, not, they're, not, they're not the freedom rallies. It'll be like, we will not wear a mask and we'll be joining them going, yeah, and we refuse to use a glory hole. <laughs> and again, but who knows though, maybe it wasn't just, maybe it wasn't just like the, the promiscuous. Because maybe there's environmental situations where the rest of us would, like imagine I came home one day, right? during the, I came home with like a big sheet of plexiglass. <laughs> and my wife's like, why have you got that? <laughs> I borrowed it from the library. <laughs> <laughs> why is there a hole in it? <laughs> well, here's the thing. You've got the COVID. I don't want to get the COVID. It's my birthday. I don't really want to have to wait another fucking year. <laughs> oh my God, I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm so sorry. I didn't start it. The Canadian government started it. Um, and it really is. It's, and it's one of the things, it is important for us to, to laugh at these things. I'm sorry that bit was a bit rude. But as I say, they started it. Um, and it's, it's been important for us to laugh to get through this. And it's interesting because there are so many awful legacies of the, of the last two years. And you will never gloss over the awful things that have happened and the tragedies. But I think one of the things we have to cling on to is, is the positives. And one of the positives is the way that we, as New Brunswickers, came together during this period. And it was, it was unlike almost anywhere else in the world, the way that you would see people, you know, uh, leaving packages for people who were isolating, looking out for each other. Like I mentioned that movie Contagion earlier. There was a scene in that movie where people were like, two neighbours and friends were fighting over, um, over the vaccine. And they killed each other trying to get the vaccine. And yet here, we, we were bloody sharing our vaccines with fucking Ontario. Who saw that coming? <laughs> And we, as a, as a region, came together, we looked out for each other, and you always see in, nature, in, 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 in film and literature, you see human nature at its worst during a traumatic thing. And conversely, here in New Brunswick, we were all there for each other, and we came together. And one of the narratives that has been, has been told to us is how hard this has been on the children. And, and there's no denying that, there's no taking that away. 
And what we've actually created is possibly the strongest generation ever, because us, between like Generation X, boomers, millennials, we are the most depressed generations in history. We spend more money on therapy and self-help than any other generation in history. But Generation Alpha, our, our children, the reason that we are, are also depressed is we've always lived for, the, for, for what's next. When's my promotion? I'll be happy then. I'll be happy when I go on holiday. I'll be happy when's something this weekend, right? We were always living for that. And every single self-help book, whether it be The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck or, or Tony Robbins or any one of those books, they all boil down to one thing. Every self-help book and every, it boils down to uh, enjoy the journey, not the destination. Live for the moment, not in an irresponsible way. And we've all, never done that. We've always looked to the next thing. Whereas Generation Alpha, our children, our young children that have been through this, they don't look forward to anything. They, look, they literally, for the last years, they've not looked forward to anything, because any time they look forward to something happening, fucking Hixie Baby cancelled it. <laughs> As a result, we've created a generation who only ever look at what's... Well, my son River, right? My son River, he never asks what we're doing this weekend or when we go on holiday. He walks downstairs in the morning and says, what's in front of me now that's fun, let's fucking do it, right? <laughs> We have created the, 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 uh, the happiest, they, they are going to guide us through the next few centuries. And, and I really do feel like this mindset of living for now, embracing what's in front of you, that's something that's going to guide us through everything. And I think we should cling on to those things, knowing that we came together as New Buns because we've got the happiest generation. And really what I'm trying to say is, were it not for a global pandemic, I would not in a million years have ever got to see my seven-year-old son waving his dick at 100 CEOs. <laughs> And for that, we should all be thankful. Um, I would like to close, if I may, with a story. Um, the, the heroes, there's been so many heroes of the past uh, uh, two years. Uh, anyone, healthcare workers, anyone working in care homes. Um, I was very honoured to host uh, the Loch Lomond uh, Staff Awards a few months ago. And Jean Urquhart is in the room. Jean, where are you? Jean Urquhart won an award. She has, for the last two years, every shift that she did at Loch Lomond. Are you there, Jean? Everyone give Jean a wave, right? A true hero, right? A true hero, give Jean a wave. Absolute hero. Jean Urquhart worked. Any time that she was doing like an eight hour shift or a 10 hour shift, she would double it and she would stay there for 16 hours at a time when everyone else was shying away and locking themselves up. She was there helping the residents of Loch Lomond, uh, a true hero. And those are the people, it's the healthcare workers, it's the people on the front line that have guided us through this. Um, there is a story that um, I was going to tell at the end of the show two years ago and, 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 and I, I couldn't do it. And now it seems more relevant than ever because it is about... Oh, someone's phone's going off. Where is it? Pass it to me. <laughs> Where's the phone? Where's the phone? Oh, hey. Oh, oh it's Heather. He Heather who organised that Loch Lomond event. Only, <laughs> only, only in St John's you talk about a thing and then the person who actually organised it, Heather Peterson, true hero. Give it up for Heather as well. She organised that. Her phone goes off exactly that point. The healthcare workers have been the heroes, um, and oh, those are my sons. They are going to—they're going to guide us through. They're going to guide us through this. That generation. They—they they look forward to nothing, and that—and look, that—that—that that, that is social distancing in New Brunswick. That's how we got through this. But the story I'd like to tell you is about a healthcare worker. It is a story uh, about a nurse by the name of uh, Nurse Lal. Nurse Lal, real name Sintra Lal, was born in Trinidad in the 1950s. She had a singular dream growing up, and that was to work with babies or deliver babies. Her uncle asked her when she was about seven years old, what do you want to do when you get old? And she said, I, I, I want to have babies every day. And of course, what she meant was deliver babies, when she was young, and she played with dolls. Then she played with her, she babysat neighbors, kids. And she, her dream was to do this. And eventually, in her 20s, uh, she became a midwife, and her dream came true. And she was stationed at a hospital uh, called the Royal Canadian Red Cross Hospital in England. Uh, there she is on her first day outside of the hospital. She was there for about a decade, delivered thousands of babies. And, and like lots of us, uh, life moved on. Now, many years later, 
she's living in uh, America, in a suburb in California. Her, her, her sister, Cheryl, who, who, who also grew up in Trinidad, she'd moved to a small town in Canada, and family was spread all over. Now, like lots of us that have family in different parts of the world, they had a little Facebook group set up to share memories and thoughts and, 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 th and news with each other. And Cheryl was very active on there, and she would occasionally post questions. And one day she posted the question, when in life were you happiest? And everyone had different answers, the day my child was born, the, the day Claire was born, maybe, my right? nice little things. <laughs> And then and Sintra posted, I was at my happiest in the 1970s when I worked at the Royal Canadian Red Cross Hospital in England. Now, Cheryl immediately responded, trying to keep it going. Do you have any memories from that time? And she went through her box and she found three uh, mementos. Uh, two of the mementos were these pictures, her on the grass and her on her first day. And the third thing she found was a note, and it was a note that a mother had written to her after she had successfully delivered the baby. Now, the reason she kept it was, A, that mothers didn't often do that, and no one's expecting them to. Mothers are very busy when they just had a baby, and they're not thinking, I need to go to the card shop. But this mother did. <laughs> And she'd rather comedically written it from the perspective of the baby. It was like, thank you very much for looking after my mummy, right? It was all kind of quite sweet like that. So she saved it, she scanned it in, posted it in the Facebook group, and it exploded, right? It got thousands of likes and shares and hearts, and it became this kind of beacon of light for people. And everyone was so touched by it. And, and then, and, 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 and Cheryl saw this love and this outpouring of joy for this, for this post, and she said, you know what, Sintra, we should try and find the baby. I bet they'd love to see this picture, this note that their mum wrote when, when they were born. And, and Sintra said, don't be ridiculous, Cheryl, that, that will never happen, we will never be like finding a needle in a haystack. But Cheryl was not to be deterred. So Cheryl went into Facebook, typed in the baby's name, and even though it was an odd name, she was quite gobsmacked to see that there was only two hits. One was clearly too old, and the other was roughly the same age, but by some, by some bizarre coincidence, seemed to live in the exact same small town as her of Rosse, New Brunswick. Now that little baby was me, and the sister of the woman who delivered me lives two minutes down the road from my house. That is Cheryl Lal. Cheryl uh, is actually here tonight. Cheryl, are you here? Cheryl is up there. Say hi to Cheryl, everyone. Cheryl is also... Cheryl is also a nurse, uh, a heroic nurse at the St. John Regional Hospital, a world-class hospital that we are blessed to have here. Uh, Cheryl is a nurse too, and we are now dear, dear friends. And I partied with her daughter, who I kind of think of as like a sister now, at Area 506. So this is the notes that my mum wrote. This is the actual note which Cheryl and Cynthia got for me. Um, Thank you for bringing me safely into this world and for being so gentle and patient with my mummy. Um, that's the note. Thank you for being so patient with my mummy from James Alexander and Jordan Mullinger, delivered by Nurse Lyle at 7.50 a.m. on the 14th of March, 1978. Now, the reason I wanted to share that story tonight was because there's a shout out to, uh, I, I make lots of jokes about how small it is here and, uh, and how everyone knows everyone, but actually it's an incredibly small world. Uh, B, if I needed a sign that moving to this place was the greatest decision I could have made, it, it was this. Uh, I also wanted to shout out to uh, healthcare workers, but most importantly, the reason I wanted to tell it two years ago on my birthday, on the 14th of March, the day this show was postponed, was that Sintra Lal, Nurse Lal, had flown to St. John. And I was going to tell the story, and she was going to be sat right there. And she was going to walk on the stage at this exact moment. And we were going to hug and embrace for the first time in 42 years to the day. And I would have said something like, uh, do you recognize me with my clothes on? <laughs> Or hopefully I'm a bit bigger downstairs than the last time you saw me. <laughs> but it was not to be. Um, that is the note. Um, and there we are. We did get to meet before distancing was introduced. Uh, a few days prior, before she flew home, we got to, I say, meet, be reunited. There we are. And my, uh, my son, Hunter, came and shot a little film of us uh, meeting or being reunited. Um, if you want to see it, you go into YouTube and type... Uh, James Wellinger nurse. I, I hope that's the only video that comes up. <laughs> that's the video, yeah. Um, so, shout out to the healthcare workers, and again, it would have been a magical moment, but it uh, could not be. Now, throughout this period, we all found different heroes, didn't we? And healthcare workers were always at the top, but we all found different people to look to, different things to cheer us up. And we all struggled with mental health issues, even if we hadn't before, maybe we did, or it certainly exasperated them. And we found heroes in different places. And sometimes it was surprising places. I found a hero 
and a savior, bizarrely, on social media. Now, amidst all of the negativity and all of the bullshit on social media and the, and the shit show of just outpouring of nuttiness, where it was like there was no nuance, right? There was basically two people. There was like, it was like two extremes, wasn't it? It was the people here going, uh, uh, Trudeau invented the COVID to control us. <laughs> and then over here, you had people going, I'm never leaving my house ever again. <laughs> the people standing in a field, you'd be walking in a trail to see someone standing in a field on their own wearing six masks. The deer haven't been vaccinated, the raccoons have got the COVID. <laughs> and we were all kind of in the middle going, well, why don't we just follow the rules and be safe, right? Uh, and it was, so I had to stop reading all the comments under the daily briefings. And I turned to a, a, a channel I hadn't heard of before called CHCO. It's the Charlotte County. Uh, do you know about this? Yes, CHCO. Yes, you know where I'm going with this. It's one of the only independent news channels in, in, in the country. And it's quite remarkable because in Charlotte County, like, everyone watches it, which makes it, like, uh, p p proportionately one of the most watched channels anywhere in the world. Like, 75% of people watching it in Charlotte County watch it. I mean, granted, that's fucking 50 people, but... <laughs> Like, proportionately, more people watch the HCO in Charlotte County than have seen Tiger King or Squid Game, right? Now, this uh, the amazing journalist, Vicky Hogarth, would, would report very sensibly and level-headed about this stuff. And underneath, there would be still some of the stupid comments. But I would go there because there was a woman that would post the most beautiful things that just, that just I will admit it, it, it they, they might sound twee when I read them to you, but they just cheered me up in moments of darkness. Her, I'll give you her name. Her name was Suzette Francine McDonald. Donald. I've never met her. I don't know who she is. Some people definitely will fucking know her because it's New Brunswick. <laughs> and I would go there and she would write the most glorious things and in dark moments and we, we had no one else to talk to. I would go on there and I'd be sat there and there'd be another announcement, new lockdown, and I'd be like, oh, more gigs cancelled. We've got to pay back the deposits. The airlines aren't paying it back. Oh, my God, how are we going to pay the bill? And I would go on there and, be, and it, it would say lockdown extended. There'd be the usual hatred. And at the very top, hers was always at the top because it was a beacon of light for so many people. They would have so many hearts and likes. And there'd be like a thousand hearts and likes on it. And this, these are some real ones that I read. And it, would just, it, it sounds twee now, but it, in a moment of darkness, Clichés and, and platitudes and, and greeting card light comments can actually really touch you. And I, this was one that really, the first one I saw, it said, we're New Brunswickers, be nicer to each other, we will get through this. Heart, smiley face. And it just shut up the detractors. It made the people that were just freaking out and being rude and turning on each other, whichever extreme they were playing, it made them look stupid. And it was touching. Another day she put, everyone was freaking out and, and calling Jennifer Buss on names and she's doing her best and they're being rude. And she said, park your rage, go to a care home and wave at the residents, let them know they loved. And you know what I did? I read that, brought a tear to my eye, went downstairs, packed the kids up in the car, we drove to the Shannocks and Loch Lomond and we waved and we weren't the only ones. People were out there and I'm thinking this is amazing, this total stranger on social media is, is guiding us to, 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 to the light. Like we're finding like positivity inside and we're doing positive things. The next day she, she put, leave a cake on your neighbour's doorstep. They could be having a bad day, bring a smile to their face. Downstairs, kids, off fortnight, we're making a cake for Jane, our neighbour. Come on. <laughs> right? We made a cake, right? It did. It brought a smile to her face. Uh, the next day, she put, go and hug your partner and don't let go. I went downstairs. I hugged my wife. She told me to fuck off, actually. Um, <laughs> read a book to your children. This is a special time. I tried that. They told me to fuck off as well. Um, <laughs> But as stupid as it sounds, these, these platitudes touched me and, 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 and moved me. And, and this stranger, who I don't even know, was, was making me do good things with my life. She, she, and she was bringing joy and positivity to me. And then in January this year, when Higgsy Baby announced uh, the, the surprise bonus lockdown that no one saw coming, and it was, that, was like, that was a real kicker for me. All the shows that had been postponed were supposed to happen then. And then suddenly it was like, oh my God, they now can't happen. And then we've got to move them. All the shows got moved to March. And I was supposed to be going to England. I was supposed to be going to see my family for the first time in three years. And suddenly now that couldn't happen. And I felt, honestly, I, I hit rock bottom. And I thought, I need to go on and see what Suzanne Francine McDonald is saying, just so I can <laughs> cheer myself up, make myself feel better. And there it was on CHCO, the announcement, but bonus lockdown, Higgsy Baby's new lockdown. <laughs> And Suzette's comment was at the very top, same thing, thousands of likes, thousands of hearts, and it just said, fuck this fucking bullshit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I've been James Mellinger. You have been amazing. Thank you all very, very much indeed for coming out tonight. It truly, truly means the world to me.
Thank you very, very much. Oh, guys, that means a lot to me. Thank you. Uh, it took two years, but we finally did this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This means the world to me. Thank you very much. I'm James Wellington. Good night. But we're not ending the show there, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, no. We're not ending the show there. Sit down. I know you all need a wee, but we cannot end just like that. We have to end on a special moment. And I thought, what can we do? How can we end the show? And I thought, we need to end on a song. What's the most definitive New Brunswick song? And I thought, uh, uh, Newfoundland have their shanties, and PEI have their folk, and Nova Scotia have their whatever the fuck, right? <laughs> what do we have? In New Brunswick, what's the definitive New Brunswick song? And I realised we don't have one, so I thought, someone needs to write one. So I thought, who loves New Brunswick as much as me? Mr. Ethan Ash. So we have spent the last six months writing a song about New Brunswick to end tonight's show. Would you like to hear it, ladies and gentlemen? Without further ado, please welcome to the stage, Mr. Ethan Ash. How you doing, brother? Okay. Would you like to hear this new song? It is on after, uh, uh, straight after this show. It's going to be on Bandcamp. <laughs> Two bucks forty-nine. It is called Ingeniously New Brunswick. <laughs> Okay, let's do it. Don't worry, I don't sing in it, I talk in it, don't worry. You don't want to hear me sing. Oh, I know what I need. Okay, brothers, hit it, Alec. Let's do this. Crank it. Well, I was living in England, I was getting so tired and I wanted to move away. With my kids and my wife, we packed up our lives and we were on the plane the next day. Am I moving to Rothsay or is it rent for Chris Pam or KV? Told my friends I'd move to St. John, the one with the A-I-N-T. But it's so strange round here that Asking why the hell I came Drunk all the time on the homemade wine But I wouldn't change a thing Oh, new, new, new Brunswick The place that I adore Live in a place where I not feel safe And you can leave open your front door Oh, new, new, new Brunswick The place that I And it's taken some time to realise things don't translate the same. And I stripped in Dr. Scott, and quiff is not what it means back in the UK. <laughs> and it's been a learning curve, and homemade wine it burns on the way out the very next day. <laughs> and some people were annoyed that a foppish British boy came and showed comedy works. But it's so strange out here, they're asking why the hell I Drunk all the time on the homemade wine. <laughs> I wouldn't change a thing. Oh, new, new, new Brunswick, the place that I adore. I live in a place where I now feel safe, and you can leave open your front door. Oh, new, new, new Brunswick, the place that I. They killed Zellers, now they killed Sears. Your directions, they still confuse me. <laughs> Where's H&M where targets used to be? Yeah. I came here for a better life and I found a home. Thank you. In New, New, New Brunswick. No, New, no. New, New Brunswick. New, New.
Mr. Shane Elton. The place that I adore. I live in a place where I now feel safe, and you can leave open your front door. New, New Brunswick, the place that I. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. Mr. Shane Ogden, Mr. Ethan Ash, that was the show. Thank you all very much indeed for coming out tonight. Ashley, I love you. I'll see you in England. I'll see you in England, Ashley. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been absolutely a joy tonight. Thank you for making our dreams come true. We will see you back again here, provided Higgsy Baby don't cancel it. Thank you very much. You know you want to listen to On Your Way Home. It's on Bandcamp right now. I want to hear that blasting out of every car in the parking lot. Um, sincere thank you all for being here. I want to give a massive shout out to everyone here at the Imperial Theatre who have worked their asses off for the past two years to keep the theatre alive, to keep entertainment going, all the volunteers here, all the tech crew, everyone upstairs. This is truly one of the greatest theatres anywhere in Canada and it's all thanks to the people that work here. So please give it up everyone here at the Imperial. Um, thank you to the St. John Hotel Association for making this happen. Daniel Timmins, I've been James Runninger. You've been St. John. And frankly, I fucking love you. I've been English. Well, I was living in England. I was getting so tired and I wanted to move away. With my kids and my wife, we packed up our lives and we were on the plane the next day. Am I moving to Rothsay or is it Renforth, Quispam or KV? Told my friends I'd move to St. John, the one with the A-I-N-T. But it's so strange round here, they're asking why the hell I came. Drunk all the time on the homemade wine But I wouldn't change a thing